He got stitches, but never snitches. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but get it on. Mandy, get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. Handball, Brian. My mind is willing, but the dong is weak. Uh, yeah, I got my stitches out yesterday. Now what does it look like? Um, Let's see. Okay. Looks like uh, it's a zigzaggy Looks like scar. a Sharpie instead of... Yeah, it was uncomfortable, Thread. but uh, I actually started thinking about it. You know, I was able to sit there, and uh nice lady had to cut out like 100 stitches and pull them all out mm-hmm. one at a time. With do the they tweezers. do the local anesthetic? They'll spray or Not something? Not for pulling out. No, but it's still, there were some trouble spots. A lot of and, nerves uh, in the hand. It did sting a bit, a time or two. Um which she would always say sorry for. And I, I've realized doctors do this. Some chiropractors, you know, they'll go, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I know this thing. All right. Yeah. I know. Sorry, sorry. I know this. And I, I appreciate it from a sort of humanistic yeah. quality. But I had to tell her, you're doing your job. Yeah. Um, you're not a sadist. I, I get I get what you're doing. You're doing it as, <laughs> as carefully as you can do it. Mm-hmm. And you do not have to apologize if something stings. Yeah. My hand was cut open two weeks ago. This is this comes with the territory. Right. So but also mm. um, versus it is probably better to have stitches taken out of your ass. Because when they're taken out of your hand, you just turn your hand over and put it on the table, and then you just sit there and watch them do it, Mm -hmm. and it looks like a mess. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's the ass, you can just bend over the table and read a magazine. Get some tweeting done. Under the boobs, let me tell you, I can't see shit. No. Because they're they're like up where they're going to be, and they had to... So I had some open wounds, which Mm. they knew would happen, because it's basically... Don't all you broads have it over... (laughs) Here's the deal. When your boobs get that big, the skin stretches. Mm-hmm. So when they're when they're sewing you back up, it's basically like sewing a paper napkin. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I have some so I'm dealing with them now, but she sutured them. Just, just stitched me, did a little whip stitch like I would darn a sock. It mm-hmm. hurts. Mm. It sure does. You doing some sock darning these days? I do darn. I darn a lot of things. If one was to darn a sock, <laughs> is it I like to homestead. Are, are, is everything so cheap now that there's no more mending going on? Like, I, I feel like I grew up where people were, cu- you know, yeah. you would buy a pair of jeans for your kid that was three sizes mm-hmm. too long mm-hmm. because you knew there was mm-hmm. going to be some gross spurt. Mm-hmm. And then you'd hem them up and then you'd unhem them and pull them down. And at some point, I don't know when this became in vogue, but at some point, they would iron on patches on your knees. Yep. Yep. Once you wore out the knees, yep. they'd get a patch and they'd iron those on. I don't know. Are, is, is everything too cheap now or kids too fat? Oh, because you used both. to be able to used to just kind of yeah. grow up. Yeah, not, now, you're going now out. we're growing out, you know, That's... and it was like your waist was a 28 and the inseam was a, you know, 26, and then at some point your waist would be a 28 and your inseam would be a 28, and then your waist would be a 28 and your inseam mm-hmm. would be a 31. Right. And they would just keep letting more out of your leg. But I feel now they gotta they gotta let out of your gut now. And You're so right. we can't you can't really let it out of the gut. No. So we gotta throw the pants away. Yeah. In the eighties, I don't know if your mom did this, Brian, but my mom didn't didn't do the whip stitch. There was a product called Stitch Witchery. Which was basically just like I had a real mom. <laughs> she did a lot of sewing of nightgowns and recital costumes, but when it came to hemming, it's just like this like strip of glue that you iron on. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I think Ronco or Popeil. Yeah, she was a big Ronco. Supporter. Had like a weird powder that you could sprinkle on and then oh. iron it. That I buy as and well. And it would work as a cuff. See if there's any Emmy any Ronco <laughs> sewing, and also they. Ronco had a mini sewing, handheld mini yes. sewing machine, yes. it too. It looked like a hole puncher, kind of. Yeah, we never... My mom didn't do a lot of sewing. Really? My dad didn't do a whole lot of darning. What? He didn't really give a darning about anything. And he didn't need Ronco's spray-on hair because he had black hair. That's right. Uh, spray-on hair was called top coverage. Oh, God. And it wouldn't come off on upholstery. <laughs> that was always my... <laughs> that was <a> selling point. <laughs> Just let your soul. I have these weird little 
comedic flashbacks of being nine years old and hearing the commercial for top covers. It won't come off an upholstery and picture someone coming over yep. for dinner dinner party on a white linen couch oh. and leaving a big black hash mark on the top of the sofa. Right, from their hair. How from big their is hair. sofa? Top coverage was you just spray it on that bald spot and you just comb that shit right over the top. I'm, I, I have it on good authority that my dad used that in the early 80s on TV. We had the food dehydrator, Ronco. We had, we had, we still have lots of Ronco products. Wow. Uh, it's an interesting glimpse into a family, <laughs> the multiple Ronco <laughs> items. We didn't have the pocket fisherman. Yeah, one suggests a kind of can do attitude. Mm. The other is like loser, poor as fuck yeah. folks. Well, well, there's I, some crossover. There's some crossover. So I, I like where your head is at yeah. when you go, we're going to get this stuff, mm -hmm. we're going to solve these problems, and we're going to save some money. So we didn't, uh, yeah, we had jeans with the iron ons. I remember another vivid memory of um, speaking of sewing for some reason. <laughs> um, my buddy Ray's mom, Irene, who was also kind of crazy and spoke with a German accent, had a big laugh. Um, one time I went over to their apartment when I was in like the seventh grade and she held up pantyhose, just women's pantyhose, mm -hmm. but she'd sewn a dick slot onto the middle of it and she went pantyhose for men and this started laughing maniacally. And I remember like being- it's good stuff. 12 kind of going like, mm, uh, I yeah. feel weird. This feels feels like yeah. I've, I've entered into some realm yeah. that uh, I should be Now I must be acknowledge. The rite of passage. But she just laughed and laughed and laughed. That's and then stuff. I thought to myself, I kind of am envious of those people who can look at something simple like that and be endlessly amused, amused by it. But it also probably means you'll have a job at the Far East Terrace cocktailing <laughs> well into your 60s. Specific. For example. Yeah. For example. To answer your question earlier, if Christy is any example, and Gina, I don't know if you do this, mm. she gets shoes repaired once they, because those are expensive items, yeah. you're going to mm -hmm. replace those. Like yes. once the sole or the heel or whatever gets Same. worn out, popped off, whatever. And you're supposed to, shoes and expensive handbags. I've never been into like the counterfeit handbag. If I'm getting one, I'm getting a nice sure. one. That shit needs to go to the leather repair shop. Um, so, uh, Ronco made, someone made the powder that you ironed on, but they made the mini, I don't think my grandmother, my mom, my grandmother, I think my stepmom, I don't think any woman in my family possessed a sewing machine. Really? We had the, it, mine came with, ours came with the table. You yeah, know, like it, it can't it. be separated from the table. Did it wheel? Ours wheeled. Yeah. yeah. It did, again, it, it shows a kind of can-do-ness yeah. that, that I like. Although, as I said, when I was at uh, Walter Reed Junior High, I did take a sewing class for some, God knows, some reason. We some all reason. did. Didn't you, Ryan? Yeah, in middle school, actually, as part of our elective. Very order. hard to thread a bobbin. I hate sewing because I had to take it for costume shop in college I am not a, that is not where I shine I'd rather hand sew on a, a completely separate note oh we're done talking about sewing yes I was thinking about this I don't even know where I was but I thought to myself shouldn't honey be more expensive <laughs> like these are the kind of thoughts we're here for the honey first off I feel like a medium sized thing of honey would last me three years. And it, it, it never goes thing. bad. It's food that has no expiration. Yeah. It never goes bad. And it lasts for a long time. I don't, I've, I haven't been honey shopping in a while, but it's probably four bucks. And Not at the farmer's market, it's like 15. Well, if you want to go to the farmer's yeah, market. You got the one of the bear. The oh bear yeah, the bear is like three bucks. And then you had to think about the process of what it takes to get that honey and make that honey yeah. and you get it into that bear. jar. Yeah, if, if I was selling honey, I'd want like fourteen hundred dollars for one of the for what yeah. it took for me to go to the hive for them to make it. Yes, and and then to go extract it and whatever purification process. You guys ever? <laughs> I went once with uh, Tom Johnson, the guy I, who was a carpenter who I used to work with. He 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 took me once to go capture a queen bee that had flown away from the hive. Okay. And How would you even know? Because all the other bees swarm the queen okay. once they fly away and like land on a branch. And then it just becomes this huge ball of bees. There's Fun. no, there's okay. no hive. Kids toy. There's just a, 
yeah, yeah. pile of bees. Okay. It's probably how the guys who do the beard of bees, which oh, was a, a thing. Put- that was a thing when I was growing up. Maybe they put some pheromone or something on their chin. Yeah, and they then, stick a queen onto the onto the imperial. Yeah, I mean you you couldn't train a bunch of bees to just hang from your chin. Mm. You'd have to. I mean, f- try to figure out how a, <laughs> the beard of bees guys does it. I've ruled out training bees. Okay. This guy puts something on his chin, and the next thing you know, he has two hundred thousand bees hanging from his from his chin, cool. like a, like a beard. But right. this is this is what happened. This is. Uh, uh, price of raw honey five fifty to six fifty per pound wholesale. Wow, that's a steal I, uh, per pound for what you have to do for it. Yeah, but I kind of feel the way the same way about hot sauce. That little shaker thing. Yeah, that thing will last me a year and a half. It's a buck ninety eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. feels too cheap when you figure out, and I don't know where the profit is. Yeah, I we mean, have to talk to Dexter. Where's the profit? I get toilet paper and all right. the things you just cycle through, right. and then I get the big durable goods, like, oh, he's just bought himself a Lexus, and that's $72,000. Yeah. I don't get the super cheap stuff yeah. that that sits around for a year at your that, home. That, like honey, doesn't seem that easy to to procure. Mm. Yes, like I, I agree. Th- it's very popular in LA and even in New York rooftops to be a bee, like a hometown beekeeper. Right. Like I have friends that do it and I don't get it. I don't get the benefit. I think it's like pigeons or even um, sometimes herb gardens I th- on the roof. I think it's like a process. A chicken it, coop. Yeah. It's a way. It's also a way to smoke somewhere where the old lady's yeah. talking about. I'm sure. going up to the roof. Tend I'm going to the bees. To the bees. <laughs> I'll be back in two days. <laughs> yeah, we have a clip of how to get a uh, bee beard. Oh, good. This guy's going to explain it to you. Thriller bees. The, the guy is covered <laughs> with bees and playing. It could be Woody Allen. We don't know. Yeah. Cannot see the man's face. So you, you get the pheromone Damn. going. You were right. Once you put that. So once the bee over Tom Johnson's dad's property, who raised some bees, you know, it's kind of funny. I was thinking about it. I used to work for Tom. Tom worked in, an, in, he had his own industrial cabinet shop down in Chatsworth somewhere. But Tom would pay me nine bucks an hour, Big 10 bucks an then. hour. Yeah, sure. so, I don't know what it was. But also, and I've been, I've been guilty of this too. Sometimes you get a guy and you're just paying him 10 bucks an hour. And, you know, you're there ostensibly to build cabinets, but you can go, Come on, we're going to my dad's house and catching bees. And you're on the clock. Yeah. You know, you're Sounds just going good. to get bees, you know. Or sometimes we, on a rare occasion, just go to the lake or just do something that he wanted to do. It's like you're renting no. a, friend. a friend. And when you got to the lake, I was the one who had to unload the shit. Sure. Whatever. But it was all. like, yeah. Yeah. So we went to his dad's property somewhere in Chatsworth. The queen had flown the nest, landed on a branch. And then all the other bees, like the beard of bees, sw- swarmed around and landed on the queen. And then uh, you have to capture the queen so you can capture the colony. So you can then put the colony in one of those white wood boxes right. so you can get more honey. But how the hell do you dig out the queen? You No, you take the whole group. Oh, wow. So you take the queen and whoever's landed on the queen, the 10,000 bearded bees, and they just hang like a beehive, but there's no hive. It's wow. just bees. Hanging to each other. And then you like get up there on a ladder and you smoke them. Mm. You hit them with the smoke. Right. That smoke, pacifies smoke. them or yeah, something. Yeah, makes them docile. And then you got to get them up there with like a burlap sack. Jesus. And all I did was stand and hold the ladder, but I had one rogue bee just just chase me like a Woody Woodpecker cartoon, like bouncing off the back of my head <laughs> like, like an every arrow. 20 feet, like an arrow while I was just running and screaming through the uh, Chatsworth <laughs> wilderness. Because somehow, like all animals, the bees know the ones that don't have fear yeah. and are there to do a job versus the greenhorns yeah. from North Hollywood that are scared to be there and they zero right in on your cowardly ass. All right, so... I was uh, sitting around last night, and I was uh, eating dinner with Sonny. And Sonny's new thing is, uh, I think he likes to upset me oh, huh. by bringing up things that he knows will upset me. Mm-hmm. 
And um, he then started saying, uh, yeah, I was looking at the uh, Rolling Stones top one 500 best bands or best songs of all time. And uh, got the Velvet Underground on there. Lou Reed. Oh, Rolling Stone magazine is t- okay. Sorry, sorry. I bet Rolling, the band Rolling Stone. Stone. Yeah, God, it's I'm confusing. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Lou Lou Reed is on there. He must know by now that you're not a hitter because you wouldn't bring this up to a volatile father. And the Velvet. I guess Lou he just has stitches removed. I, right. I guess right. Lou Reed was with the Velvet Underground. I Emmy Emmy knows for a period of time and then struck out on his own. As far as I know, I watched the Lou Reed documentary hoping to learn more about why this man is so beloved. I was mostly annoyed. Founder of the Velvet Underground. All right, so Lou Reed can't really play an instrument or sing or anything, but it's all about affectation and wearing cop sunglasses and smoking cigarettes. He looked very cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I will play you uh, what is uh, Lou Reed's hit. My favorite Lou Reed song, actually, I, I like one Lou Reed song a lot, and it's called Dirty Boulevard. Oh, that one's pretty cool. Sorry, but it'll still sound like shit. Uh, yeah, Rolling Stone has him as number 19 greatest artist of all time. Yeah. So I need to know, Amy, who's below oh, no. 19. Don't do this to yourself. It's, it's going to be Marvin Gaye is 18. Sorry. Oh, no, other sorry. Uh, Bo Diddley. Oh, we're going the other. We're going the other direction. This is this is racist. <laughs> Otis Redding, 21. Otis Redding, you too. You too. <laughs> Twenty second. Not as good. Bruce Springsteen <laughs> is twenty third. Now none of them, none known as prolific or as good as the Velvet Underground. Jerry Lee Lewis is twenty four. Uh, Fats Domino twenty five. The Ramones twenty six. It's also weird. Prince twenty seven. Well, I'm not a Prince fan, but Come compared on. to the Velvet Underground. The Clash, 28. Oh. The Ramones are better than The Clash? The no. Ramones are a fucking joke. Uh, listen, uh, look. <laughs> you, you have to... This is this is the problem. This is the problem with uh, corruption in um, Rotten Tomatoes mm-hmm. or the mm-hmm. Oscars or whatever. We all have to sit around and pretend like the Ramones are a better band than The Who because right. the Ramones are 22 Ooh. and The Who is 29. Who? <laughs> Who? And the problem with the corruption is, is we can't base it on cool points. We have to do it on Mm. product. Who has better product, the Ramones or the who? And I like the Ramones, but there's no possible way. There's no, there's just no comparison, but the Ramones are a cool band to say you like, and the Velvet Underground is a cool band to say you like. So they must put it, it's, 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 uh, it's my uh, Tignataro Mm. Um, <laughs> conspiracy, which is, she's not a particularly funny person, but she, you must say that you like Tignataro because then you get the cool points. Mm. So there's a comedic version of that. There's always been a band version of that. It's the cool kids deciding on what's cool, but not based on the. It, it's it's kind of the. It's 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 why we love sports. Like I don't care how cool or uncool. Bill Belichick is. He just wins. wins. He just wins. And then thus, that's so it's why. Right. It's, it's kind of the end of the meritocracy. Right. There's no meritocracy in the world that would have um, the Velvet the Underground or the Ramones ahead of the Who. And or you can keep going on that list and, and think, see some other bands or Prince or from, anyone to be outraged. And from 1 to 30, they should have to defend their choice and their placement. Yes, I would like them... I would Stevie like Wonder. Otis Redding is at 21. Dude died before his song came out. <laughs> that's right. That's what uh, that's what we that's what we ascertained. Johnny jo- Cash, 31. 31. Uh, Smokey Robinson in the Miracle, 32. The all Miracles, all uh, all well behind the Velvet Out Underground. The Everly Brothers. <laughs> Uh, Neil, Young. Neil Young, Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson. Oh, I thought he was in top ten for sure. Madonna, Madonna sure. thirty six. Roy Orbison. It's all John, John Lennon. Lennon. It's all a slap in the face. To David the Bowie's thirty nine. Didn't he discover uh, Lou Reed the Velvet Underground? Wow. Don't play other career to him. Simon and Garfunkel and forty. Fuck you, Simon and Garfunkel. It, it, the, the Doors. doors it just, they it, gotta write sometimes. It just keeps going. Van Morrison. This is, this is fantastic. Yeah, speaking of the doors, my 
My son said Janis Joplin, uh, Run DMC. DMC. My uh, Elton John. Oh, that's hurtful. Oh. That's hurtful. <laughs> All right. So there's. We don't have to look at anything that Rolling Stone ever writes ever again and pay any attention to it. My son, who's trying to get into old music or or whatever, he's always trying to figure stuff out. Like you know, I was talking to him about the Hollies. The Hollies, Hollies have a bunch of great songs. People don't really remember the Hollies, but uh, were they a long, cool woman in a black dress? Yeah, but they're also song. also he ain't heavy. He's my yeah. brother. You know, they had yeah. like a lot Grand, of that had a Grand lot Nash, of range. Dawson? Yeah, Graham okay, Nash. Yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> Good call. And I said to him, he said the Hollies. I said he said something with Buddy Holly. I said yeah, they were named themselves after Buddy Holly. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then he was like, oh, what? when did Buddy Holly die? And I said, I don't know, 57? Well, it was 59, and then he's got his phone, and he's going, oh, okay. And then the Hollies came around in 62, and I'm trying to explain to him what the Hollies did and some of these other bands of that of yore. And then uh, I said to him, uh, he said, what about the Doors? Do I? What's with the Doors? Do I, should I listen to the doors? the doors? I said, I never liked the Doors when I was young. Although Break On Through, I always thought of as like one of the first punk rock songs. I thought of that as a great kind of punk song. I don't know if Gina had the same experience as me and seemingly everyone else in my life, but like by the time, well, you're much, you're much younger than me, right. but by the time I was like in high school, the doors were like part of your classic yes. rock starter pack. Yes. Like you had to have the greatest Well, hits. the movie put it over the edge. And then you yeah. got past that and was... found more interesting bands. <laughs> I but ne- the, I, tell them to watch the movie. Yeah, I never, I was like, ah, the doors, I don't know. And, but as I got older, I kind of appreciated them more because they're more interesting. You know, some of their songs like Crystal Ship and stuff like that in the end and stuff like that, they're really interesting i don't you know you don't sit around and pop your fingers the soft to it. parade yeah they're they're they're, I, they're an interest super interesting band i first heard of the doors when i was 13 years old from the dead milkman song bitch and camaro oh wow mm. and speaking of punk rock and the dead milkman or the dead kennedys or the dead somebodies uh i have to uh, issue uh, a correction what have you done on this show? Well, butthole surfers. That, that, yes, that oh. led us that led us down a path. Ami Horowitz, who does all those videos that we talked about, Ami sent me a, a text that said, "I heard the show the other day before we started getting into the butthole surfers. What about the butthole surfers and detachable penis?" I read it as mm. the butthole surfers. Wrote Their detachable yeah. penis. He meant, what about this other funny mm-hmm, band mm-hmm. with a funny name and, and then this crazy song? Oh. Okay. So then I let us down that path, but he wrote me later that I'd misinterpreted. Thanks, Alan. How are you going to give us that 45 minutes back, Adam? I know, but it was exacerbated by <laughs> Emmy taking to the internet and the internet saying a lot of people yeah. think it's a butthole surface. Anyway, so I, I wanted to be fair and balanced. All right, let me tell you about. They're number 50 on uh, Rolling Stones yeah. list. Too. Zip Recruiter. So much to do during the summer. If you're a business owner, the last thing you want to do is sort through tons of unqualified candidates. And their resumes. Well, you want to be barbecuing. You want to be sea kayaking. You want to be out in nature having fun, not looking through a stack of resumes. And that's why you need ZipRecruiter. They do the work for you. And now you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Adam. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find and match the right candidates with you and the job you need them to do. Easy to review uh, these recommended, uh, sorry, recommended uh, candidates, and uh, you can review it. They'll recommend them, and you can invite them to apply and uh, make them your top choices to apply. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. It's ZipRecruiter, right, Dawson? Soak up all that summer has to offer and let ZipRecruiter do the work. Ready for the URL? It's ZipRecruiter.com slash Adam. That's where you can try it for free. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash A-D-A-M. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. All right. Dawson has an article about uh, why you might want to think about getting an electric car again and what goes into that and a vid that's kind of funny, too. And we'll, on the same note, we'll uh, listen to that right after this.
It's time to check Adam's voicemail. What's up, Corolla? You're the only person I ever heard mention this type of car. And the other day, you guys were talking about first cars that we ever had. And my first car was a 1987 Renault Alliance. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Renault Alliance. The Renault. That's not real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Renault is still uh, very big into uh, F1 racing, but uh, no Renault. Renault, I guess they pronounce it. Uh, Not here. I feel like maybe they're state owned or state whatever in France and they make cars and sell them there. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe it's like a Canadian radio station that's forced to play (laughs) Brian Adams. Certain number of Canadian artists. Because... I, I don't think Renault can compete in sort of the open American market when we have a choice of 70 no. wonderful offerings from a varied from varied automotive manufacturers, but maybe they could compete if the government <laughs> subsidized them a little bit. <laughs> All right. So, uh, you know, people are starting to kind of wake up to the fact that, well, actually, Emmy, we can play that video that somebody tweeted me, which is, um, <clears throat> electric cars are great. I would uh, like to have an electric car. Gas is seven bucks a gallon here, and uh, and I get it. But um, they're starting to kind of wake up to the fact that nothing is just free. No. You know what I mean? Like it's you, not a panacea. You get an electric car, you plug it in, you drive for free, mm-hmm. and it's great for the environment because it doesn't do it. It's like, it's like where are we cutters. starting from? It's like cable cord yeah. cutters. If you're going to pay one way or the other, it's a matter of you know what you want to have. Yeah. Now, I said millions of years ago on Loveline, I just went, we just need a whole bunch of nuclear power plants and then electric cars, and we would charge the, nucle- the electric car from the from the power plant, from the nuclear power plant, and then the environment would be saved and it'd be win-win. But we tried to get rid of the nuclear power plants while simultaneously pushing the electric cars. I don't know about you guys, but we're heading into the summer. It's getting hot out there. Mm-hmm. And daddy's getting himself a whole house generator because I can't take any more of these fucking rolling no. blackouts, which are sure to come hit SoCal which is also simultaneously the epicenter of the electric vehicle push, except for there's nothing to put into the tank of the electric vehicle because we're power grid is such a fucking mess. It's, it's typical sort of political stuff, but this is funny. Someone tweeted me this. This is a, a woman. I don't know what town she's in. She's very proud. She's explaining that the, you know, the new city hall or the new building has the first charging stations put in, and they're doing a ribbon cutting oh. ceremony and everyone's feeling very proud of themselves because they're now making the switch to electric and we're going to clean the environment. And the, the, the plug on the electric sign is green, of course, because sure. it's all green. It's <laughs> 95% Lansing. coal. Nice. Again, I guess, yeah. All right. So I know we're all patting ourselves on the back about the electric car, mm-hmm. but 95% of the power for the electric car is coming from coal. So, so where are we at with the environment? We and we're so... It's weird. We're very obsessed with what's coming out of the tailpipe all the time. Mm. We've cleaned up what's coming out of the tailpipe quite a bit, but I don't know what's coming out of the smokestack mm. of the coal-powered uh, facility that is charging all mm-hmm. these cars. So it seems absurd to be so enthusiastic about the Part B, but not the Part A. Right. Part A is we need a lot of clean, renewable, abundant electricity to power the cars that we're all patting ourselves on the back on. But furthermore, no one really wants to think about it, but you want to power an electric car. You know, your car, your Subaru, my car, Brian's car, we have a battery. That battery is filled with some of the worst shit on the planet. Mm -hmm taken from the ground in some of the worst places on the planet. But that battery is the size of a lunchbox and weighs about 13 pounds. Uh, An electric car, you got about a thousand pounds worth of batteries. And the question is, is where's all that shit coming from? Well, the good news with that, though, is once you 
bury the battery, it just biodegrades and becomes trees. Well, that's the whole thing. Like the people, I mean, I was talking to Bill Shatner about this and I was like, hey man, we got to get some nuclear power plants going. And he's like, well, what do we do with the isotopes when they're done with their run? And we're like, well, how do we dispose of them? It's like, how are you going to dispose of these millions and millions of batteries that, that are no longer good anymore? Yeah, but uh, there's an article that uh, Dawson has. Is it ethical to purchase a lithium battery-powered EV by Ronald Stein? With numerous state governors having issued executive orders to fade out the per- phase out the purchasing of gasoline-driven cars within the next decade or so, and the automobile manufacturers' efforts to phase in to only manufacturing EVs, Here's some food for thought about the lack of transparency about clean energy exploitations. In an oil well, 100% organic material is pumped out of the ground, taking up about 500 to 1,000 square feet. Then it flows in pipelines, safely transporting the oil to the refineries to be manufactured into usable oil derivatives that are the basis of more than 6,000 products for society and into transportation fuels needed by the world's heavyweight and long-range infrastructures of aviation, merchant ships, cruise ships, and militaries. Each lithium supply mine usually consists of 35 to 40 humongous 797 Caterpillar haul trucks, along with hundreds of other large equipment. Each 797 uses around a half a million gallons of diesel each year. I never even really thought about that part. Just to get it out of the ground, we got to use a fuck That's load a of diesel. You keep going back and back Everything and back. is, every single piece of heavy equipment is diesel powered <laughs> and it's all got to be used. And if you've ever seen any of those monster trucks, have you ever seen those things where like the tire is nine yeah. foot tall and they got to get a <laughs> two stage ladder to get up there? Like they're massive and how much they burn, but all right. So with an inventory of just 35, the haul trucks alone are using 17.5 million gallons of fuel a year for just one lithium site. There is virtually non-existing transparency of the environmental degradation and the human rights abuses occurring in developing countries with yellow, brown, and black-skinned people. That's the other thing, too, which is, you know, you want to sink an oil rig, you make a hole in the ground and you go straight down. You want to do a mine, you have to take out all the earth in a 20-mile circle, essentially, is creating these huge... I mean, literally tearing the earth apart. And talking about human rights abuses, uh, send some kids in there and see if it collapses. <laughs> yeah, well, there are places we don't really no. care about. Both human rights abuses and environmental degradation are directly connected to the mining for exotic materials and metals that are required to manufacture wind turbines, solar panels, and EV batteries. Today, a typical EV battery weighs 1,000 pounds. Damn. It contains 25 pounds of lithium, 60 pounds of nickel, 44 pounds of manganese, and 30 pounds of cobalt, 200 pounds of copper, and 400 pounds of aluminum, steel, and plastic. Inside are over 6,000 individual lithium-ion cells. It should concern you that all those toxic components come from mining. For instance, to manufacture each EV auto battery, you need to process, you must process 25,000 pounds of brine for the lithium, 30,000 pounds of ore for the cobalt, 5,000 pounds of ore for the nickel, and 25,000 pounds of ore for copper. All told, you dig up 500,000 pounds of the Earth's crust for just one battery. The current fossil fuel infrastructure is less invasive than mining for the exotic materials and metals required to create the batteries needed to store green energy. In developing egregious human rights, no, in developing countries, these mining operations exploit child labor and are responsible for the most egregious human rights violations of vulnerable minority populations. These operations are also directly destroying the planet through environmental degradation. The 2022 Pulitzer Prize nominated book, Clean Energy Exploitations, Helping Citizens Understand the Environmental and Humanity Abuses that Support Clean Energy, does an excellent job of discussing the lack of transparency to the world of the green movement's impact upon humanity. How many? I'm, of- I'm, I'm really just saying we can't just go, hey, get an electric car, and then we save everything. Like nothing, yeah. every, everything is attached to something else. 
there's this and then there's that. You can't just make proclamations about we're going to shut down the pipelines and we're going to go green and then everything's <laughs> right. going to be great. Like, no, it's all attached to something. Nothing is free in nature. No. It's very nuanced. And you have to can take into consideration many other factors yeah. other than I'm going to go to the uh, Sprouts in Santa Monica, I'll just plug my car in and that'll be it. Yes. Well, and it's like, we don't even have to think that far. You think about iPhones. We all have them. And like literally people jumping out of the building because the 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 what the conditions More are so bad so yes. they put a trapeze net on the bottom like we're we're doing this all the time to ourselves I want to tell you that if I worked in one of those chinese sweatshops with the guys I went to high school with <laughs> we definitely would have taken a shot at that net oh sure like oh. we would have gone up to that roof yeah. and dared each other to just do a fall into I'd that. I'd be disappointed if you didn't. Yeah, I would too. The whole point is that it won't kill you. I mean, we went to the Mulholland Club and jumped off the three-story <laughs> roof into the swimming yeah. pool. That took 10 minutes for us to figure that one out. Sorry. How many environmentalists are going to support lithium mines in America? There are two things needed to make Well, that's a good point. None of them. <laughs> there are two so things. Then, then it's this weird intersection, which is... The environmentalists are also the human rights people. I mean, it's the same group, you know, so you would never permit this in Indiana. No. So why in India? Mm. See what I did there? That was yeah, nice. That was good. Close. Yeah. You'd never permit it in New Mexico. <laughs> All right. Keep Go going. on. <laughs> there are two things needed to make the EV, EV technology work for the billions of lightweight cars. Get the mining practices for these exotic mater minerals and material metals to the point where they are acceptable to the environmental movement and stop the environmental degradation and human atrocities occurring in developing countries where people are being exploited with yellow, brown, and black skin. Further development of battery technology to somewhat clone how phones have been reduced in size with smaller and smaller batteries and increased capabilities in those small phones and reduce the alarming tendency of lithium batteries and their charging sources from spontaneously catching fire without warning. So the next time you're thinking about purchasing an electric vehicle or driving your EV car, before congratulating yourselves on saving the environment, remember that it came at a cost of entire mountains in developing countries, thousands of square miles of land, and billions of gallons of oil and fuel. Mm, you know what? I need this article for the next time I go out to eat with a vegan <laughs> and the cunt starts talking about the cow. You know, you know what it takes? Mm. For one cow, one cow, mm -hmm. takes seven acres uh, sure. of open grassland. They, oh, you drove your fucking uh, Prius here, didn't you? Cunt? Yeah, because I care about the earth. Well, let me lay some fucking stats on your ass. Okay, hold on one second. Can I just get another matcha uh, tea, but no straw? Oh, Go ahead. This will be the last Beyond Burger you enjoy, bitch. Oh, no. Let me lay some stats on you. All right, sorry, Dawson, we got to the end. We should all know that an electric vehicle battery does not make electricity. It only stores electricity produced somewhere, primarily by coal, uranium, natural gas-powered plants, and occasionally by intermittent breezes and sunshine. So to say an EV is a zero-emission vehicle is not at all valid, as 80% of the electricity generated to charge the batteries is from coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Since 20% of the electricity generated in the U.S. is from coal-fired plants, it follows that 20% of the EVs on the road are coal-powered. 40% of the electricity generated in the U.S. is from natural gas. It follows that 40% of the EVs on the road are natural gas-powered. 20% uh, nuclear, so 20% nuclear-powered. Life without oil is not as simple as you think, as renewable energy is the only intermittent, elect is only intermittent electricity from breezes and sunshine as neither wind turbines nor solar panels can manufacture anything for society. Well, there you go. Uh, so think about that. Yeah, it's kind of sad, but true. If 20% of the power for your electric vehicle is coming from coal, then that's what's powering your vehicle, and, or 40% natural gas. Or, and then by the time you get to nuclear, then everyone in Santa Monica is fucked because 80% <laughs> of what's powering their vehicle yeah. is uh, one of the energy sources they hate. Last paragraph here hmm. draws the uh, conclusion that uh, electric vehicle uh, buyers should be aware that they're buying blood diamonds. Ah, oh. nice. Stick with my suit. I never thought I'd say this. Can you wear some Lou, Lou Reed? <laughs> some Velvet Underground? All right. Uh, he, he had one. 
Oh, no, I was joking. All right. He had that I Love You Diane song, which is horrible. I know two Lou Reed songs. I know the two yeah. Lou Reed songs everybody else knows. You don't have to add it was horrible. Uh, you, you're right. Just It's a Lou Reed yeah. song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, Walk on the Wild Side and uh, Perfect Day. Oh. Oh, Sweet Jane. Wasn't that? Oh, wasn't that, uh, I, I always think of Cowboy uh, Junkies. He <laughs> had a cover. hit, a, a sort of poppy hit in the mid 80s called maybe the early 90s called I Love You, Diane, or Bud I Love You, Diane, I think. I got I Love You, Suzanne. Oh, Suzanne. By Sorry. the early 90s? Who else was on the plane? Like Richie Valens? Big Ballins, Bopper and, and I was Richie like, Ballins. Big Bopper. And he's like, who's the Big Bopper? And I'm like, I and don't the know. pilot. In the pilot, Roger Peterson. Well, yeah. Well, oh yeah, Dawson would. I don't really know how to explain. Who the I big, played. I big played Bobber legendary is. Lubbock, Texas disc jockey, high pockets Duncan in the uh, Santa Barbara City College production of Buddy. What? The Buddy Holly story. Wow. Wow. At the first and last lines in the entire play. <laughs> And you, you would know this. So wasn't it Waylon Jennings who gave up a seat? Yes. yes. Yeah. And isn't the only Big Bopper song that anyone knows is Gentilly Lace and Pretty Face? What I like. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Emmy, did we ever... Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, Sean Weiss, who's going to come in here in, in, a, in a minute, you know him probably mainly as uh, Greg Goldberg and the uh, Mighty Ducks. He did all the... He was the goalie, did all the movies. Very interesting, harrowing story. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. But his last film before the 14-year heroin odyssey was... Uh, Drill Bit Taylor from oh. 2008. Yeah. And uh, that is a, oh God, well, uh, Owen, Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson, yeah. Agree. Owen Wilson movie. And I don't know if you ever found that uh, at the movie thing, but oh, we didn't. <laughs> oh, we don't have that? Or, Emmy, do we have that or don't we have that? We're looking for it right now. Oh, you didn't look for it an hour and a half ago when I told you to look for it? No. I'm curious how that works. Okay. Leslie Mann's A lot of looking for it right now. Is there a bit to this? <laughs> well, you were gonna you were gonna look for the at the movies review of the hammer that I told you about an hour and a half ago. We're currently looking for it. Right, but way back an hour and a half ago when I was on the phone with you, I said, uh, hey. We do we have it in our I completely understand somewhere? and I apologize. We're looking for it right now. All right. Well, anyway, it just reminded me because my movie got reviewed with Drillbit Taylor. Oh, was, the was bundle. The, was, the, was, the, was the week, and I'm trying to think of the other, kind of think of what the other uh, movie was that it got uh, reviewed reviewed with uh, as well. But anyway, I heard Drillbit Taylor. I haven't heard Drillbit Taylor in a million ah. years, and it, and it struck me. The only good thing about making an independent film is you, you don't get paid. You certainly never make any money. It's it's really it's it's a it's a labor of love that uh, where there's no not enough love <laughs> to go around. But on off chance that your movie could be reviewed at the movies, um, that that was that was a crazy. I, I watched. At, now this is Richard Roper right. at at the movies, right. but I used to watch at the movies at my mom's house when it was on PBS. Or it was syndicated. We watched it on Sunday yeah. after evenings, you know, four or five o'clock, whenever it was on. Yeah, it, it started out here on like KCT or something, wow. or like a like the, the public channel. Oh, did Huel ever talk to him? <laughs> no, I wish he'd been up in that balcony. I would have pushed his fat ass <laughs> off it. Could have saved us a lot of time. So, uh, footnote: you guys ever see you guys ever see the uh, Roger Ebert documentary Life Itself? No. It's yes, I think I did. It's beautiful. It's the same guy who did uh, Hoop Dreams, Steve mm. James. Oh, so it's got to magnificent. Be good. It's great. All right, uh, let me tell you while well, Emmy looks for that about uh, LifeLock. Higher property values have increased home title fraud. The fraudsters, well, they file a title transfer to do a bogus uh, ID. And then uh, they, they'll sell, refinance, uh, take loans against the victim's property as well. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft affect our lives. Your personal info gets exposed so often. It's easy 
for a cyber criminal to steal your identity. Protecting your identity can be easy with LifeLock by Norton. LifeLock detects and alerts you to potential identity threats you may not spot on your own, like loans to take out in uh, your name. If you become a victim of identity theft, a dedicated U.S.-based restoration specialist will work to fix it. It's LifeLock, right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours with LifeLock by Norton. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code ADAM. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com. Use promo code ADAM for 25% off. All right, Emmy, did we... Did you find that we in have the movies? It's, just down, it's uploading right now. While they do that, I should point out that uh, Life Itself, the very good documentary about Roger Ebert, is streaming on Amazon Prime. If you are a uh, Prime subscriber, mm-hmm. you can watch for free tonight. Right. It went all the way through his cancer. And yeah, all yeah. That. It, was, it, was, it showed lots of archival footage of early Siskel and Ebert. It was great. Was he an early pioneer sort of mixed marriage guy? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't say early pioneer. They got married... <laughs> I remember specifically because it was uh, he gave a bad review to Unforgiven, the Clint Eastwood movie. And when it came around that it was like not best picture and blah, blah, blah he kind of went back and said, you know what? I wasn't in a good headspace. I think I was just about to get married and I was like you know, all up in my own head. And it's actually a really good movie. So it's a long way of saying I think he got married to his African-American wife in 1994 to mm-hmm. nine, early 90s-ish. All so right. you're blaming her for the bad review? I've, he did. I didn't do anything. All right. Uh, and they got, sorry, this is a fascinating ahead. thing. They got a sound alike to like to to um voice narrate the documentary. Oh, that's it's, good. Uh, the whole time I was like, because Ebert's laid down thousands of hours of of footage on TV. Like, did they get some sort of AI to like mm. make him you know his voice recreate his voice? No, it's, yeah. just, it's an absolute sound alike. You could take someone's audio. You know, you could. Oh, they take could do that for you by now. Condoleezza's <laughs> Ri- Condoleezza Rice's audio book and cobble it together to make her say, "I like being cornholed." Well, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> It'll sound a little choppy. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, here's. Uh, at the uh, at the movies, so drill bit Taylor's up on the <laughs> it is. up up on the poster, and they're up on the balcony. And is this A O Smith or A I F U or F I S H R Puffins? I can't think of the reviewer who's next to Roper. I think but it is you. Well, well, A O something. All right, me. sorry. Here we go. Stay now, how do you feel song, better you than know, drill bit good Taylor? Good that's, that's, the that's, yeah. that's the takeaway. That's the takeaway. How do you feel about everyone going? A lot of high voices. <laughs> It lets you know what they thought of you going in. It wasn't a total disaster. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of that in my life. Hey, nice guy. Who knew? (laughs) Yeah. All right. Uh, Sean Weiss is going to come in, and uh, Natanya Ross is going to come in, both actors that you recognize as very famous childhood actors are now taking a different turn in life, and we'll talk about that right after this. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. Nicaragua. If you said the hammer. Nicaragua. You're correct. Now, back to the show. Sean Weiss is here. Natanya Ross is here as well. Both uh, very busy and famous child stars who then um, found addiction and hard times and occasional imprisonment, but uh, (laughs) are are now on the road to recovery and sober and have a very interesting story. So uh, thank you for coming in and sharing the story with us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Let's uh, start with Sean. You started off, I believe, at age five doing a Jell-O commercial with Bill Cosby? Yes. So that, are you you from L.A.? I'm from New Jersey. Mm Mm-hmm. And so uh, I guess there was a talent scout holding a, uh, some kind of open casting call. And so my mom took me into that. And very shortly after, I did that Jell-O pudding commercial with Cosby. And I guess I did about eight or nine Jell-O spots with him. So you were the Jello kid. For like a while. You really were. Yeah, yeah, for a while. When did the Mighty Ducks come around? How old were you when I that guess started? I was 13. There's a line in the movie where he talks about uh, you're going to become a man, so that's typically 13, right? Bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. 
So I guess I was 13, and then from 13 to 16, we did Mighty Ducks. You did all three of them. Yeah. And Natanya, you started out where? Um, I was six months old. Jesus so <laughs> I know. Not consenting actor. It's crazy. I, we were just on another podcast. They said, like, when did you, you know, mm-hmm. decide you wanted to do this? And I think I was already just so in it by the time I was cognizant of what was actually happening. So, yeah, I started at six also during commercials. I'm from New Jersey also, Asbury Park. Um, and, yeah, we were in L.A. by the time I was eight years old and just like a steadily working young when actor. Did, what was your, when did you break out? What was the first big role? So the, I did a lot of Broadway in Manhattan, and then I got a show out here in California called Billy, and it was starring Billy Connolly. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that was it. That oh, was my uh, big one. Network sitcom. Yeah. You remember, guys remember Billy yeah. Connolly? Yeah. Of yeah. Course. He was. From Head of the Class. S- sort and, of yeah, a sure. thinking man's comic. It, I, yeah, British I, guy, uh, reverent. He was kind of duck. He was kind of Ricky Gervais before yes. Ricky Gervais, yes. like more interesting, thoughtful, kind of cool. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, I, I like that guy. Yeah. Uh, so you did that. So you guys, re- you, you possibly just revived his whole career. <laughs> I, think. <laughs> I think I may have brought him back. Yeah. <laughs> you guys come out from uh, New Jersey, come out to L.A., mm-hmm. and does the whole family transfer? I came out here just to be like on a TV show, and while I was out here, my mom sold our house. Oh boy! And she didn't like check with us to get permission <laughs> or anything. And uh, all my stuff sold. Like, hey, how you doing? Sold all my stuff. All my shit was in. So I moved out here kind of by force. And uh, I don't know about you, but but the acting roles were coming around, and yeah. money was coming in. Yeah, when I came out here, my, I think my mom had a very distinct plan to like make me a star. So there was no question. We were once I got Billy, we moved out here, and uh, she asked me. She said, "Do you want to go back to New York and try theater again?" And I said, "Let's just give it a year." And in that year, everything really took off, and we never went back. We well, got uh, the Babysitter Club mm-hmm. and Freaky Friday and a mm-hmm. bunch of movies and TV yeah. shows. Yeah. So when and we'll start with Sean. Um, when did it? When did it start to come undone for you? Um, I don't know. It's, uh, that's kind of like a long, uh, maybe like a five or six year uh, stretch you, you might be talking about. But basically, when it really started to come undone for me with drug addiction was about five years ago in my late 30s. And I just got into a situation where several things happened in my life. I lost my dad. I had a bad breakup. And uh, I found hard drugs for the first time, and it kind of just made me feel better. You found <laughs> hard drugs for the first time a little bit late in life for yeah. most people, right? Definitely. I had never even seen it before I was 36. What, uh, what drug or drugs did you find? Uh, all of them. No, all every of them. drug. At once. Uh, yeah. Because I was there, missing some drugs, and I was no, wondering what they're happened. They're usually ne- in the same <laughs> vicinity. Them? Yeah. Can I have um, them back? But I unfortunately got addicted to meth and heroin. So I know you gave me credit for the heroin before, but you didn't give me credit for the meth. Meth, the most insidious, and I and I also can't. I mean, if you did sort of a food pyramid of drugs, you know, you got like you should do that. Yeah, yeah, you got like pot, you know, and it's like all right, yeah, that's your base, that's your grains. You eat the food pyramid, and even um, you know other there's other mushrooms and other drugs like that, but. Meth seems to just destroy everyone faster than any other drug. And it's also, I don't know if anyone's ever done speed. It, it's 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 kind of off-putting if you're not into it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, it makes you like, act when like people go enough. like, I haven't gone to bed for five days. Sounds like the most... You know, look, if you talk to any, and I've talked to many um, Navy SEALs, and you talk to them about essentially going down to Coronado Island and being tortured for four months. And what they get tortured by is they have to pick up some Zodiac raft and run in the mm-hmm. sand, you know, with four guys mm-hmm. and do push-ups with them. They'll, they'll take a mask full of seawater and put it on them and then tell them to go out and do push-ups with a mask full of seawater. <laughs> and they'll tell them to go tread water for 24 hours in the ocean, stuff like that. But if you talk to any of those guys, they'll go... 
The worst is at the end you have to stay up for one week. Sleep one week? That, they make that you could like kill you, I thought. Stay up for, you know, maybe it's six days or something like <laughs> right that. Right up to the point. With some weird intermittent, like uh, you can close your eyes for yeah, 20 minutes yeah, and yeah. come back or something. Uh, but they just go, uh, the worst part is none of the physical shit. It's all the, I. we have to stay up for one yeah. week. Sean did that for free. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, people say, they talk about not sleeping for a week. I mean, without exaggeration, I'm sure I went for stretches where I probably didn't sleep for a month or two. <gasps> and you know, like I'd, fought, you know, nod off somewhere for about an hour, but I didn't sleep for no months. No meaningful right. sleep. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it, I, I mean, honestly, you, you miss... You get a bad night, you know, you get sleep deprived two days, yeah. minus yeah. Oh. any drugs, can't and you're right. psychotic. Like, yeah. you cannot sleep. Well, now think that I'm straight. clean, I can't imagine, like, I miss one night of sleep yeah. and I'm thrown. So I can't yeah. even. We were just talking about this yeah. at lunch. Like, looking back on our old lives, it's, it's, it's wild. It's hard to imagine yeah. it like that was us, really. Mm. What happened? Uh, what's your drug related story, <sighs> Natanya, by the yeah, way? Yeah, so I got into it pretty young, and I was a. Uh, you know, in my teenage years, I was a Nickelodeon kid. So. This is not a competition. You don't have to beat me <laughs> in everything. Everything. But like, uh, I, I stayed win. up for 11 days. I win. So I, I had a lot of pressure on me in, like, kind of the public eye, which was very different in the 90s. There's, you know, nothing like what it is now. But I was expected to behave like a good Nickelodeon kid. So I think I really started to rebel against that young. And, yeah, by the time I was, like, 18, 19 years old, I was strung out on heroin. And with that came a lot of other drugs and a lot of other experiences that, at, you know, at, as a kid on television, if you had told me that's what my life would look like just five years later, it, it would have been, you know, more than I could handle. So, yeah, by the time I was 30, I was already sober. You know, I had done the, the stints in rehab and in and out of AA and all of that stuff and, and finally got it when I was 30 years old. So I have definitely a different experience. Um, yeah. Were you good at hiding it? Because um, I feel like Nickelodeon and your mom would have some some things to say about it. Well, I mean, yeah, my mom blamed my it on the slime. <laughs> oh, sure. She's like, yeah, I she know said, I, I don't like know shit. too many times. Yeah, <laughs> my my mom's kind of a different story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely got in trouble. You know, I would show up on set with just doing the wildest things. I remember one time in the middle of filming an episode, I cut off all my hair and bleached it blonde just because I was like, fuck you guys. I could do whatever <laughs> whatever I want. Wow. And promptly got called up to Nickelodeon executives <laughs> and the creator of the show. And But aside from that, yeah, I was, I was getting really good at hiding it. And by the time I was 19, 20 and lost my career completely, I was no longer like caring whether or not I could hide it. So I just hid myself. I just completely removed myself from like any semblance of a social life and a real life that I had ever had and kind of went to these dark places that we tend to go to in downtown LA mm -hmm. and just crazy shit that feels like a whole other person in a whole other lifetime, but it's mine, yeah. you know, it's crazy, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were talking to Dave Navarro in here not too long ago about just what you'd have to do to get drugs and the places you would go and yeah. the people you'd get them from and the parts of town they were in. And what you'd end up ingesting knowing it's probably not drugs, but okay, maybe it'll get me high. He uh, said he like ground up concrete, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, mean, it's, yeah. it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Especially yeah. now with fentanyl. It's, it's yeah. crazy. Oh, I uh, thank God that that was not. Oh, you if know, fentanyl was a thing, I'd you probably dead. would have OD'd be, for sure, probably right? Be dead. I, I yeah. got off drugs like right as that stuff was hitting the street. Right. Otherwise, I probably definitely would have yeah. been a casualty. Mm. And working in treatment now, I mean, I'm seeing, I mean, every kid that's coming in, every person that's coming into us, it's all fentanyl. And we're hearing something every day that someone has passed away. I mean, friends, I mean, it's crazy. This epidemic of fentanyl is unreal. Yeah, we know where it's coming in from. It's coming in from Mexico. We know the Chinese are helping out, and it's coming across the border. I, I don't know why there's not a bigger focus on it, but there doesn't seem to be. I mean, we talk about fentanyl, how bad it is, but we don't really go, you know, like like the politicians are like, hey, there's a school school shooting. We want to go after the gun manufacturers or, or go after, we want to make some laws or whatever. All right, well, if everyone's dying of fentanyl, who's manufacturing right. the fentanyl? Where's it coming from? And Slow your roll, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I, did, I didn't know where that? it was coming from. And I've actually been wondering about that because, 
it just seems like a bad move for a drug dealer to that's like what I said. Yeah. That's what I said. put something in there that's yeah. way dangerous. Yeah, that part definitely doesn't make sense. You Much have a more customer potent, for life. Cheaper, yeah. Don't kill them. It's bad business. Yeah. So I, think, I don't know. I think the story is it's the Chinese labs and either the China, I've spoken to a few experts about this, the Chinese either they're setting up labs in Mexico or they just, the Chinese make it and bring it in through Mexico and then they bring it across here. They're, they're cloning fentanyl now. And what happens is, is there are these little nuggets that when they don't get po- properly po- pulverized into a pill or whatever it is and people are getting a... Uh, a chunk. A chunk of it versus a dusting of it, and that's where the Odin comes from. Yeah. But it's 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 hairy, it's scary. And I don't know. So what do you guys think? Well, you're saying the quality control at the Mexican Chinese drug manufacturer is not, is not what it used to, to be. We're not gonna stand for this slander. <laughs> so we're 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 and and I don't know. I feel like drugs, so many despondent it's like every story is like every teenage girl between the you know over the age of 13 and under 20 is fucking suicidal and picking at themselves and doing drugs and committing suicide and ODing like it just seems it seems like a I I you know I I know this stuff always existed it, I don't think it existed to this extent and I don't know if you guys have some thoughts on that Oh no I mean we're looking at a totally different world now um, I think, you know, there's a mental health epidemic that coincides with the fentanyl epidemic and everything else that's going on. And there's a lot of untreated mental health that, um, yeah, I mean, I've never seen anything like this. It's It feels like you can't even touch it to make a dent in it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's horrible. It's, yeah, very scary. Well, then you have families like, you know, the Sacklers and stuff that aren't making. So it's coming in from another border and it's coming in from here corporate yeah, yeah, yeah big pharma whatever yeah that's so how i like, got started i mean i got in a car accident when i was 17 mm. with one of my best friends jenna and you know we were kids and they prescribed us all this vicodin and valium for like a, a scratch on our <laughs> arm and we didn't know what it was and we started taking it and it was <laughs> fucking awesome <laughs> so we kept taking it and then one day it's just it turns into something else you know there's a definitely a vicodin gene which everyone seems to possess or they don't and and it doesn't really matter what age you get started i've heard so many stories about the guys like 55 Mm -hmm. straight arrow never did any drugs and he had back surgery then he got the vicodin then he moved out to the street you know it's like yeah it's not the same as you know cigarettes booze there's pot even there's kind of a window if you get past the window you're not going to take it up in your your 50s but uh yeah i noticed that people i'm I'm sorry i noticed that people as soon as they if they take an opiate and they feel nauseous Mm -hmm. they're not an opiate person yeah and yeah. if you don't feel nauseous, then be careful. You right. could definitely You're probably a, slide okay, down yeah. a slippery mm, slope. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I never liked Vicodin. Same. Lucky. Good for I, you. I just, <laughs> Lucky. You don't, yeah, you don't have any, like, in a in a medicine cabinet somewhere, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, from, like, I, I just had surgery and all this stuff, and they prescribe it, and I could uh, take it or leave it. I, I'd rather leave it. Right. You, know, you could just take your extra strength Tylenol and get on with your life. So yeah. I'm I'm lucky that's just not my wiring. But it, yeah. you, people in my family who aren't that lucky. So yeah. you don't know. And Drew, Dr. Drew, uh, says that the wiring of the uh, folks of the Jewish persuasion is for the pharmaceutical yeah. stuff. Oh, a little less with the booze, a yeah. little less with the pot. And sodium. A little more. That's so interesting because so I'm Jewish. Uh, <laughs> people have too. wiring. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, like American Indian, that's booze. Right. Wiring. Wow, right. yeah. That's interesting. Drew, am I right about that? Right. Right. So the Native <laughs> American, that populace would be more, you know, firewater, right? That makes right? sense, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then for the Jews, that's more prescription and medication. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then also easy to get because, you know, your brother's a doctor, right? I mean, if you're Jewish, right? Crazy. He's <laughs> <laughs> checked out. That's, doc- now, that's, that's what Dr. Drew sounds like when we're doing a podcast and he's in New York and he's looking at his phone the entire time <laughs> pretending like he's engaged no, in a conversation. No, the phone is not on, the TV is yes, not on. I'm listening to you. <laughs> no, you're not, Drew. You're looking at your phone, <laughs> pretending like you're doing a podcast. And now I'm, I now I don't know whether or not Drew right, is actually I, on the phone or not. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, let's ask Drew. Are you on the phone? Crazy. <laughs> well, I thought you'd be on the phone. I thought you'd be on the phone sometimes. Uh, well, sometimes I do. I'll tell you what. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. So, anyway. <laughs> it hits. I Look, I just got hand surgery uh, two weeks ago, and they gave me Vicodin. And I took it a couple of nights where my hand was throbbing before I went to bed. But it it just wasn't a, you know, it's a kind of take it or leave it. Yeah. Or, or it'll be... I guess actually, it's the appropriate use of it. If you got major hand surgery and your hand is throbbing, yeah. then you take one and you, you go to bed. But I didn't wake up the next morning wanting to. Crazy. And that's and, and that I think that problem. speaks to the the uh, aspect of this problem that is about mental health, because for a lot of us, the drug is just a release from whatever you know problems where we can't deal with. So us, you know. In that the physical euphoria wasn't enough to hook you and isn't enough for some people. It's that added element of being, you know, a, a stress relief. So when you have something that you're running toward the pill and running away from something else, it's the perfect combination. It's also so like a, it. it's also like a kind of the the perfect chemical equation to like get that part of your brain that just won't stop saying like you're not good, you're not good, you're not enough, you're not pre- all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. It like quiets it for just long enough so you can go like I can fucking breathe right. like that's what pain pills do for people like us they uh, they know? showed us a tape in, in rehab that was really helpful and kind of helped me get a, a broader perspective on my own situation so it was a tape about this thing they called the hedonic scale are you guys familiar mm-hmm. so it's a scale that sort of measure or measures your uh, your pleasure <laughs> whatever like hedonism yeah. sure yeah. I think mean, that's probably what it and so on an average day a regular guy Adam walking around is like 80 that's not the number, but I'm just making that up. 80. Uh, if you're depressed, that number 60. If you've just fell in love and you're about to get laid, it's like 100. If you do meth, it's 1,200. Wow. <laughs> it's 1,200 out of 100, basically. Right. Yeah. So wow. that's what, that's what wow. you're dealing with. So. Wow. I'm basing this on nothing but intuition, but it doesn't it seem like someday, hopefully soon, we'll be able to like map that human geome and see what the, the, the who has the genes for addiction, right? Yeah. Who's like predisposed, oh, yeah. or yeah. I mean, it, we'll be able to take a blood test or whatever test and figure it out. It, well, and I, I don't know if this is a direct comparison. I, this is not my area of expertise, but that's why I think a lot of people refer to addiction as an allergy because some people are just allergic to it. It's going to make you want to do it more, you know? It's yeah. Like, sure. It's a predisposition, right? To, yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. I think you have a 50 50 <laughs> shot. If you come from alcoholics to have it, mm. at least as I recall with Drew, like if one parent or the other has it, then or both, then, yeah. then you got a 50% chance. It doesn't mean you're right. going to be an alcoholic. It just means you, you'll get some momentum well, and maybe you, maybe you shouldn't. What, Drew? Right. Yeah. No, we said, that, you said you're right. That's correct then. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then, so Sean, um, you have this acting career. You're doing all these big movies. Uh, the drugs set in. Uh, at some point, you're incarcerated. Um, I have a very dear friend, a very old friend, who uh, had a real drug problem, and he got incarcerated. And he says it saved his life because when he's just out on the street doing sure. drugs, he for sure was going to die. You know, we do this thing all the time. We're like, we, the answer isn't to incarcerate these drug addicts. It's like, oh, for some of them, yeah. it might save them. <laughs> no, for, it's like poor man's rehab, really. Right. Uh, and when you're there in jail and you look around, it's like everybody needs to be there. Like there's nobody in jail where you're looking at <laughs> and you see that guy and you're like, you know, that guy's doing fantastic. He doesn't feel like he needs to be here. So uh, definitely a lot of people are in jail in L.A. County Jail, I would say 95% of the guys are there because of a drug-related situation. Mm. Something they did when they got loaded or something they had to do to get loaded. So, yeah. yeah, you had to steal. I mean, you're unemployable and you have a habit, right? Yeah, and there's other things that I wouldn't do. You know what I mean? Like, I probably didn't have to steal if I didn't, if there was, like, some lines I didn't want to cross. 
Do you know what I mean? No. I'm trying to say I would have sucked porn? dick for drugs. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't know how to gotcha. say that. How do I say that? Because you get the Mighty Ducks goalie outfit on and uh, head I down probably, to West that's Hollywood. A, that's a money maker yeah, right there. Like, yeah. I didn't know about OnlyFans. Oh, I was <laughs> OnlyFans. I was working way too hard out there to support my habit. And I know this. I know this now. So you got caught for stealing about 150 bucks worth of stuff at an electronics store. Yeah. Which used to be enough to... Yeah get you into trouble in california not now no <laughs> no not now now you have to steal like five or six thousand dollars uh-huh. worth. at least 900 for them to even at, follow you out the door at gunpoint right gunpoint. right right yeah no cops would uh i would get arrested and the general attitude would just be a general just we wish we wouldn't we wish we weren't here having to do this but i'd have cops like i feel like i got so lucky the probably the best part about being in the mighty ducks uh was that the la deputies Sheriff's deputies are huge Mighty Ducks fans. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, like, they would hook me up with, like, extra peanut butter and... Oh, when you're inside. Yeah, perks. you know, yeah. the perks, the bit, you know, the important thing. So, um, but, uh, no, I had cops, like, take me to McDonald's on the way to jail and wow. stuff. So. Oh, really? They recognize you. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I got really lucky. Yeah, know? yeah, you got a, a four-leaf clover <laughs> <laughs> up sure. your ass. But jail <laughs> was horrible. To take me to Mickey D's on the way to the prison. <laughs> That's so, oh, but that perk. was really what uh, what was enough of a deterrent to get me to want to get clean because I can't stand jail, you know. Yeah, what was that like? Where were you? Oh God, jail is horrible. I was just in LA County. You're a lot Twin of Towers. Time. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, horrible. Um, yeah, and I did some. I was up in uh, Marysville for about fifty days or so. Jail is uh, God. Jail is so bad. Uh, I mean, I got beat up four times just in the waiting room for jail. Just to wait to get in jail. And I'm not kidding. How did that work? Uh, well, usually a guy just tees up and you know how <laughs> he, he tucks his elbows. But does he have a it. beef? You know, does he come I got, at The you? first time I got punched in jail, um, I laid down on the floor next to some guy. And I guess he thought I was too close to him. Mm. And he said something to me and I didn't really hear what he said. And by the time I could be like, what was that? He just jacked me right in my face. So there wasn't enough beds, so you just lay right. down on the floor. There aren't beds, oh, and there aren't. when in you're in, yeah, when you're in holding for like sometimes 17, 18 hours, guys just pass out on the floor. So that there was a lot of that going on. I, I don't know when the Twin Towers downtown were built. Everyone says it's a shit show over there. Oh my god! You know we are los angeles california it is 2022 and we're always talking about this surplus like california has stuff can we build some of this like a little more i don't know yeah, sanitary so or we build something. LA Live. Like, Come on. we have like big cages yep. where yeah. scary people go to pick at themselves because they're coming off mm. of drugs and, and then punched. fight amongst yeah. each other with no no place to yeah. sit down like I and don't feel like we could do better and because. there's a lot of money coming in too it's not like you know these are charitable operations right right so you you went in there you you stayed how much how much time did you do total uh i had one of the luxury suites Mm -hmm. for about five weeks one time and the longest i ever did i guess was about 80 days and what's the schedule like on an average day and Uh, are you in protective custody (laughs) uh yeah i i do i when that when i get to la county jail they k-10 me which means, like, maximum level protective custody. Mm-hmm. So, which is usually reserved for guys, you know, who have killed multiple people. And they walk around in the orange suit. And they just have me in that suit because they know that if I'm in general population, probably some shit will go down. So, yeah. it's designated by the color of the suit? Uh, well, the guys in orange are like, keep away. Like, uh-huh. you got to stay away from these guys. And I wish everyone they had else that for L- dating. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, they do. A chick wearing a traffic cone on her head? <laughs> Steer fucking yeah. clear. No uh, can do. It's a nightmare. I mean, I think if you showed up wearing an orange jumpsuit, yeah. people would just oh, the trick. Right. They'd get the point. They'd so they have another color for the sort of general pop guys, and that's the way yeah, they Yeah, that's can... blue, general pop. Uh, then there's powder blue. And that's for the, you know, the gayer guys. Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, it's kind of like the deck of an aircraft carrier, you know? Exactly <laughs> like that. <laughs> but the craziest thing, and this blew my mind, like, right when you get there and you're about to go into, like, the dorm, uh, when you get to jail, you have to join a gang. 
For real. For real. Like, you got to declare what gang you're in. And I just was not, I didn't know. I was like, do they have a child actor gang? Yeah. <laughs> How's it? Where yeah. do I sign up? And then literally. <laughs> they might. They, they should. <laughs> LA. Um, there's like a guy that's like the head of the department in charge of like recruiting newcomers. Who's and it's a, like. Who's a prisoner. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But he's like in charge Outreach. of like he's selling. He's got the table with right. the brochures <laughs> exactly. on it. Why, yeah. why I, the low riders at, are happening now. At one now. point I felt like I was getting courted by like CAA or something. Right? <laughs> Um, and I, I know they knew that if I went with them, like having Goldberg in your uh, gang is definitely some street cred on oh, wow. some level. Oh, yeah. So, um, so how's that work? I went with so Southside. There's, there's a guy Southside that's kind of <laughs> running the yard, the area, the tank, the whatever, and he's going to decide what group you go with? No, you're going to decide. Well, uh, yeah, but he's going to help you <laughs> well, you make see, that decision. I mean, he gives you his best pitch, and I don't know what his incentive is for recruiting you, uh, you know, other than, like I just mentioned. Um, but, but you have to take up with some group. you got to uh, pick you one. You can't be independent. You can't do independent, yeah. Did you get a tattoo? I didn't. You, that's nice. I didn't. Well, what I, group did you go with? I felt like if did I— Did you pledge? Um, yeah, I went South Side, South, South Side, Side, because they were the. I felt like they shared food uh, best. Oh. Like they were they was always concerned with like, are you hungry, Holmes? Like, <laughs> that kind of shit. You so know? race really didn't come into play. Uh, well, no, I like Mexicans too. But I mean, you're even yeah. allowed to be. You that? can can you be? Yeah, I think you can. I don't know. That's a good question. Well, there is I no, guess you can. There's I no think, Jewish gang. Right? There isn't. I think that would be uh, black or other. That's oh, the other. Other. Yeah, there's oh, a category wow. for other. Well, okay, so <laughs> where we so in Kansas City, there's the BBYO, the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization. So you, <laughs> you probably well. would have been, you know, that yeah, would have been the, my my clip, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's always weird because I feel like we understand how bad prison is when it's totally segregated. They got uh-huh. the Crips and the right. Bloods and the Low Riders and the South Area Street Nation. guys. You know, they're all, yeah, they're all whacked up. Then we come to the outside, and that's where we're, we're essentially trying to run a version of that out here. Like, as a black one, as a Latinx woman, of, uh, as a lesbian, it's like, oh, that's what we're doing now? We're just going to segregate everybody. Just pretend it's the yard. And you don't think yeah. something bad is going to come from turn, yeah. turning every group into their own group, and then people start saying, I'm in charge of this group, and I'm going to fight for my group, and I'm going to get my group more... Less you weightlifting on this side. Yeah, you don't. You don't, you don't if it's not a good <laughs> idea in prison, why would we want to export it out? So you get with the Southsiders. Yeah, I went Southside. Where you get a little more smooth peanut butter out of that crew. Uh, yeah, and they had this one machine that impressed the fuck out of me, where they uh, they rigged uh, their uh, metal bunk bed and turned it into a frying pan, a giant frying pan to, uh, upon which to fry the bologna. Oh, wow. yeah, Which is another on. trick that L.A. County uh, uh, plays on the prisoners, because not only you got a thousand sweaty guys locked in a room, but you're feeding them hard-boiled eggs and bologna. Oh. That's li- f- for real, and that's the only uh, food option. What was uh, yeah. what was breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Uh, breakfast is like a, har- a hard-boiled egg thrown at you um, <laughs> and some cereal and and for lunch you get a bologna sandwich with a bag of Lay's mm. oh. and yeah you know <laughs> the like Lay's, trip. I would trade my Lay's for cereal a lot and uh, for dinner I remember eating dinner a lot okay. so I was think it, there is a dinner I think it's just I think the three hots and a cot is bullshit I think it's just two lukewarm <laughs> and a steel <laughs> a frying pan yeah. weren't, you, weren't you hungry all the time all the time all the time. That's all anybody is in jail. You're freezing all the time and hungry. And I think it's because it's a good way to keep people, so, you know, subservient. Mm. Uh, or was that the word I'm looking for? Yeah. 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 Because, you know, if a guy's uh, fed and warm, he's more likely to, you know, fuck with you. Yeah. So, yeah, you're just starving the whole wow. time. Unless you get somebody to put some money on your books and then it's all ramen noodles. Why do I feel like I didn't want to be like the authority on what it's like to be? <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. Jail. So someone can put some some family member, a friend could put some money in your account. Yeah, and then you could go to the snack shack and get some <laughs> uh, ramen noodles. It's all in. It comes in. You order. You order, and it gets dropped off to you. 
Now, right. if people, I'm trying to weigh, <laughs> weigh this against everything I've ever seen on TV, both reality and otherwise. If people find out that you have money on your commissary, do they try and roll you for that? They could prob- possibly do that. But you are you didn't have that. I didn't really have to fuck with that because that was K-10. Oh, yeah, that's know? right. Oh, K-10. The presidential yeah. suite. Right. <laughs> But Jill really, I'm going to say, it corrected my facility. When I'm in the middle of a day and I'm depressed or I get frustrated, I literally taught myself to think about what it's like to be locked up in a jail cell, and it makes me feel better. It's like air is nice. I do the same. I think of being at home with my parents when I was 12 and going, oh, now I feel better about my lot in life. Look how far you've come. So let's talk about the organization, because you guys got a a nonprofit here going, uh, Hope of the Valley. Are we talking about the San Fernando Valley or any valley? No, that's the rescue mission, like, right down the street from here. Yeah, it's right here. So the the San Fernando Valley Feed the Homeless, that's my nonprofit. I started that 10 years ago with just kind of, like, the hope of providing a couple meals to people on the streets and a little hope. And, um, you know, I've been in a... Uh, rescue mission line on Thanksgiving waiting to get like a box of juice a pair of socks and a little sandwich just kind of looking around at your life like how the fuck did I get here this is so insane. you're in line you're not handing it out you're I was it handed I was to once you. in line yeah getting it ha- on Thanksgiving mm. you know I mean that's I want to say demoralizing but it's not really the word it's just like kind of this like emptiness in the soul that's so heavy it's like It's kind of hard to explain, but I never forgot how that felt. And I think kind of my saving grace in recovery has always just been to lead with a heart of service. So, yeah, 10 years ago, I was just driving around the valley, and I was like, fuck, there's a lot of homeless people in the valley, and everybody's so focused on Skid Row and Venice and Santa Monica. I just got a couple friends together, and I said, what can we do? And we raised, like, $150 and bought, you know, 80 sandwiches that day. And then I really realized that it just takes one person to inspire another, to inspire another. And then you have, like, a crew of people that want to do something. And we weren't, like, unrealistic about it. We know we can't eradicate the homeless, it, you know, epidemic, another epidemic that we're looking at right now. But to just make a dent is is more than most people are willing to do. So we started there, and then 10 years later, now we fed I don't know, close to half a million people. Uh-huh. Um, it's, you know, we, we got a little stuck. So where Hope of the Valley comes in is we got a little stuck during the pandemic because the events that we throw are like two, 300 people. We try and invite people from 12-step community in so they can have the experience of like going back on the street and handing out food and seeing that like, just like Sean said, like if you're having a horrible day, which I, you know, I can still get caught up in this too. It doesn't matter if I'm sober or not. You forget that there's people living on the street that don't even have basic human needs right now, like a shower, a toilet, all of that stuff. So in the pandemic, we got stuck because I couldn't throw the events. Um, And somebody had mentioned Hope of the Valley to me. And I looked them up and saw that they were raising money to build tiny home communities for the homeless population. So basically to bring somebody that's homeless on the street into the shelter of a tiny home. And because I work in treatment, I really wanted to know what else was going on because it's, you know, listen, it's one thing to take somebody off the street and just put them in a home, but that's not enough, right? Like we have to provide services so a person can hopefully eventually get to their permanent housing. So they're providing three meals a day Um, counseling, job training, therapeutic services, addressing psychiatric needs. They were giving people vaccines if they wanted it. If they had abscesses on their body, they were getting them to the hospital and getting them medically fixed up. And I was blown away by what they were doing. Um, I just, I thought it was so beautiful. So I kind of got involved, you know, I have a little bit of a platform, right? And I wanted to do something with it. And I brought my friends into it, like Sean and some of our, our other friends, and uh, yeah, we were able to fundraise enough money to sponsor three of these homes, and um, I got to decorate them, so I put little <laughs> crystals and sage and, like, you know, my headshot. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just we just got to get really involved with all of this, and we got to go down and actually meet the people that moved into the homes. That was, like, a next level for me. And Is it meant to be... Permanent, more or less, or is that kind of transitional? It's transitional. So here was the really cool thing, too. I was concerned that, like, well, 
when you bring somebody in, how quickly are you going to kick them out, right? Right. So the sponsorship is actually only $3,000 for the longevity of their entire stay there. Um, so they can stay a year in that tiny home if they want to. But there's a team of people, counselors, case managers, that are advocating for these people to, you know, they're getting them new clothes, job, all of this stuff. So this is the last thing they ever have to do before they're handed keys to permanent housing. Wow. And they're working with Section 8 and all of that kind of stuff, too, to make sure they can help this person get to the permanent housing. Because it's just, it's one thing to take someone off the street, throw them in a tiny home and say, <laughs> hey, good luck. But these people... Happy masturbating. Yeah, right? Or, <laughs> you know. So it's an incredible organization. And oh, now yeah. we've been doing... Speaking of masturbating, <laughs> when you're in that... <laughs> sea of humanity with the scent of fried Ooh. bologna wafting over your head. Musk. How does a uh, man satisfy himself? Is that a shower activity? Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to look away. I don't want to wa watch him. <laughs> I <laughs> thought, you know, all that stuff uh, about the showers and don't drop the soap. And mm. I, I thought that was just in the movie. <laughs> oh, boy. It's However, uh, you know. Dot, dot, dot. It's odd. Adam, you're looking at me like you're almost frightened. Like, <laughs> do, you Is there, really? do you see stuff going on in the showers? I mean, you know, it, it's not a great place to shower. Yeah, yeah okay. You want to shower somewhere else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the more you know. The more you know. <laughs> I forgot you. Is there any... I, I, did you get your own cell? Or was it always like in the tank with a? Yeah, no. I, I at one point I did have my own cell. Oh, well, all right. Well, that's where. Yeah, no. It a felt like a. It felt like a hotel suite. Wow. Once it you got nice. your hotel, I right. mean, once you got your own cell. Right. It was versus nice. being in the tank with everyone. And I think they had me in the hospital, so it was like glass doors. I was in like the hospital wing. Oh, sweet. So they could keep an additional uh, mm -hmm. eye on me. So it wasn't, you know, awful. Well, let me give the uh, website out. It is hopeofthevalley.org, and you can uh, go there and find out all that they're doing to help. All right. I think we should take a quick break, and we'll come back. We'll do the news. You guys hang in and crack wise with the news. From one Jewish theater nerd to another, oh. we're going to have to talk about your stint on Broadway because okay, I haven't forgotten about that. <laughs> I tried to. <laughs> um, also, uh, when you're talking about the tiny homes, we talked about this, I think, once on the show because I saw it on the news where a woman said, like, you know, they're saying, like, how how grateful people are for it and what is it doing for you? And, of course, I have shelter and I have this. And one woman was like, I have an address. I can get a job. You can't get a job without an address. That's 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 yeah. it right there. So that was, like, yeah. a really big deal. Huge deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. cool. Well, you can work construction. <laughs> and get an address. Yeah, or at least you could. Yeah. Maybe not anymore. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about Kevin Spacey again because those charges have uh, come to fruition, the new ones. Oh, yeah. He's been charged with four counts of sexual assault against three men oh. in London oh. over different periods of time. Now, we know that the word sexual assault has become sort of an umbrella term. It could mean many, many things. I'll just let you know that he one of the charges is engaging in penetrative sexual activity without consent. So yeah, well, that's, that's more I than, think that's what's... Than Al Franken. I mean, that's right. bad enough with consent. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's right. Right, even with the proper forms. Yeah, yeah. no, you're right. He's due uh, at the Westminster Magistrates Court. And this week, the charges follow a review of evidence gathered by the police. And this is over different years. One was in 2005, um, up to 2008. And they weren't all non-consensual penetration, but there was at least one. You know, we talk about, we're talking about drugs a lot, and like hoping, you would hope that your kid doesn't get the alcoholic gene and the life that would happen. But uh, super horny gene. That's a that's a career that's killer too. Yeah, that's not a good one either. I, it'll undo your fucking marriage. Yeah. It'll fuck up your career. Like if you're yeah. just that fucking dude who's got that hamster, that horny hamster mm -hmm. wheel spinning hard all yeah. the time, you'll become a disgraced producer. Yes, like you you know we go like oh these guys are criminals, these guys are rapists, these guys are whatever, but. Yeah, that's where it ends up. It starts off with the super horny gene. Like, I got to fucking get some. Like, yeah. had some roommates that uh, had the super horny gene. It, it's, you look out you the window at four in the morning, there's a fat chick in the hot tub, and you're just thinking, come on, man. I told you to go to bed. <laughs> it, it'll get you into trouble. 
There's a gay like version. Yeah. There's a straight version. There's a, you know, wreck your marriage version sure. of it. It's just that weird. Like, all guys like being with either guys or women <laughs> or d- depends in prison Go sometimes. Ahead. You can alter your course a little bit there. <laughs> But there's only like a handful of guys that just need it all. Yeah. They gotta have it all the fucking time. Well, isn't that what your hands for? I mean, don't they make fleshlights? That's what my hands for. Got it. That's what one's <laughs> hand is for. On your junk. Understood. Okay. But the guys, that, that's the problem. The hand, no, no good. No bueno. I mean, it's good for us. It's not good for them. They gotta right. go out and get some. Right. And get then some they strange. Get, then they get into trouble. Understood. And then the problem is they're so fucking horny all the time <laughs> that when the answer is like no or back off, they they keep, go, they keep the going. Has been flipped, That's yeah. right. That's where the hand comes in. So yeah, he's gonna go. He's going to London to appear. So we'll see what happens now with Kevin. Um, some Lizzo news. Lizzo, everyone, you know, the patron saint of like inclusiveness is called out on something that what? she did in a song. And she is going to rectify it. Um, she's been accused of using an ableist slur in one of her tracks uh, from a song called Girls. And she shared an apology and released a new version. I will tell you the slur in a moment. Um, in a Twitter post on Tuesday, Lizzo said an updated version of the song was released after it was brought to her attention that one of the lyrics is a harmful word. Um, she said, let me make one thing clear. I never want to promote derogatory language. As a black, fat woman in America, I've had many hurtful words used against me. So, I, Brian, please. So I understand the power words can have. So what was the word? Um, ableist. I, that, no, right? it was an ableist no, word. No, I know, but that, yes. that's, a new, that's a title yes, for those ableism. who are not confined to a wheelchair. Correct. So hmm. I'm going to play you a very short clip from right. the song, and you tell me if you can figure it out. I'm all handicapped. Am I going to be offended? Oh, and, my. and it's like <laughs> it's a song like from my youth, a song like "Do the Hustle." Mm-hmm. Is that an entire ableist song? Oh, sure, because yeah. you can because stand up and do the hustle. You're telling everyone to move to your right and move to your left. And dun, 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 dun. I didn't see a lot of people with stroke right. canes the or hokey wheelchairs. The hokey pokey is problematic. Oh, my standard. God. You Macarena, can't do that anymore. The list mm-hmm. keeps, goes the on and on. Yeah, yeah, so you tell me if you can find the, the offensive word. Hold my bag, bitch. Hold my bag. Do you see this shit? I'm a spaz. Oh, oh yeah. obviously, yeah. Yeah. Spaz. Spaz oh. is no bueno. I thought it was because she's saying hold my bag. Yeah, as though you have arms to hold right, it. No, yeah. it's the word spaz. <laughs> uh, many. And by the way, do you know how many reports I had to go through to find the word? Oh, they blurred it out. SP asterisk asterisk asterisk. And I was like, what word can this be? Yeah. And they wouldn't even print it. So, um, yeah. Is as, that sunblock or is it a slur? It, like, what's this you. SP short <laughs> for? Thank you. And then. And also, hold my bag, bitch, doesn't sound particularly <laughs> Super friendly, friendly yeah. either. <laughs> so she she has already changed Wait, the song. Yeah. She also sampled the Beastie Boys on that one. She did? Yeah, the beginning sounds like girls. Brian? Oh, did you hear it again? All right. Look at you with the Beastie Boys. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sadly, I know it. Go ahead. Like my bag, bitch. Oh, yeah. I'm a spaz. Yeah. Oh, can we believe that out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, find good, girls good and find that. I think. No, that's it. That's it. So that's now it. they got a case against. That's right. Well, I don't know. I don't know the difference. So there's a sampling where you go, hey, may we sample right. your song? Like a uh, Weird Al. Mm-hmm. Sure. You just go, hey, Paul McCartney, may I use your song to talk about whatever stupid he gets too much credit he way too much credit but anyway everyone loves him fine but then there's the stuff that just that's clearly girls and i don't know if you had to ask for that going does she does she asking for it i would guess yes they have to pay for it however the beast boys have a lot of balls to sue at this point because they made their career of unlicensed sampling well also good point lizzo's 27 and a half like Maybe this is her producer just going, hey, I got a cool riff. Bum, yeah. bum, 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 uh, my guess is they paid for it. Yeah. Really? It's just so right. obvious. Well, I, I bet they paid for it. Well, but that's a good point. With the Beast Boys yeah, having beef over that. Point. Yeah, they would never sue. No. Well, Do we should have we girls? hear the, we'll, we'll hear it. And we'll, oh, confirmed she sampled, she sampled it from the song. So Look she did sample it and she did pay for it, evidently. 
All right. Well, there you go. Dare we hear girls? Or well, we could, we could okay. but now we know. Now we know. They, okay. They did. Great. Mm-hmm. Um, Justin Bieber is having um, some uh, wild is times. Yeah, yeah. this is sad. So you've probably really? heard about this. Oh, I didn't hear. Have you not been watching TMZ? He loves TMZ. I watch TMZ every <laughs> first off. How dare you march in here and accuse me of not watching TMZ? <laughs> oh, then this is going to blow your mind because this has been a fucking headline every yeah. day. So he's been diagnosed with something called Ramsey Hunt syndrome. No, and it's a rare complication of shingles. So, which I guess makes it some sort of herpes because it's like chicken pox, shingles, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it attacks a nerve in your ear. It can paralyze half your face, which has happened to yeah. him. I'm going to show you around. Around five out of 100,000 people per year seem to get it. And it's common among people over 60 that are immunocompromised. So he's, I guess, just been working too hard. You know, Uh, this is on me because I... I was watching TMZ as I always do, and it was like it was like, oh, Britney Spears got married, we'll get and there. her first husband showed up yeah. and crashed the party, and and all that, and then like a picture of Bieber's came yeah. up, and then like my phone rang, and yeah. I like turned it down, and it was like, all right, he's dropping a new album. No, or this something. is crazy. And then I just kind of slid past yeah. it and then picked it up again. This is this is wow. really like a, a thing. Like you've heard of like Bell's palsy, yeah, where you just kind of wake up with it and you can't move half your face. Well, that. That's what it looks like. Also, um, apparently, and Dr. Drew obviously will know more about this, but you, the symptoms are ringing in the ear, ear pain, hearing loss, sensation of spinning, a little vertigo, change of uh, taste and smell, dry mouth, dry eyes. So he, Justin, and the clip is really long, so I just did a little snippet. But here's a little clip of Beaver talking about his struggles. Now, just for us in the studio, notice really take uh, attention to his face. One of his eyes won't blink, one of the side of his mouth won't move, so just watch. Um, I hope you guys understand, and uh, I'll be using this time to just rest and relax and get back to 100% so that I can um, do what uh, I was born to do. But in the meantime, yeah, this ain't it. If your face gets frozen, it's good that you look like Justin That's Bieber. That's also yeah. true, yeah. yeah. It's just frozen in hotness. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You think that neighbor, remember when he egged the neighbor's house? Yeah, sure. Think that guy's happy? Probably. And it's like, well, <laughs> That's fucking yeah. payback's a bitch. That's right. Karma <laughs> bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Not saying it would have prevented this. No, I'm, I'm just saying there there's is one guy not there's one for him guy that's happy that he got. Probably doesn't want him to die of it or anything, but just happy he had a setback. That's the neighbor in like Calabasas where he yeah. ate this house. Yeah, so that's does fair. he have to just wait this out? Or yeah, there? it's. I mean, it's curable just by I guess like getting your immune system back to where it needs to be, like chickenpox and shingles and all that shit. Mm. Yeah, there's oh. just no like time frame on. You just don't know exactly right. when you're gonna wake up. Right. And, because it's a virus, so you can't, antibiotics aren't going to do anything. I always wonder how much money everyone has. I mean, I know he's doing okay. He's fine. But I don't know anyone could be like, I'm just going to take about six months off. So yeah, I can just see how re- it goes. Get recentered here. That's right. Regroup. Rest. Like, recover. Just rest up and recover. Like, could you imagine that? No. <laughs> Celebrity <laughs> net worth has me at $500,000. Really? And they're only off by about 490000 or so. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know who's doing their research, but I almost fucking called them just to be like, uh, I just want to let you guys know, whoever's giving you that info, <laughs> fire them. <laughs> well, I was told I'm a millionaire. Adam was told he has the same net worth as Weird Al. So they're a little all over the place. Mm-hmm. Our producer, Chris. Figured out he had a nine million dollar <laughs> net worth. Yeah, yeah I don't know likely. where I don't know where this comes from. I don't know where it comes from either. Maybe they figured you're doing the gay porn though. Maybe they oh, figured yeah. it's like you're hammering oh, yeah. those checks. Right, right, right. But we should Residuals talk to them. on those. Yeah. yeah, we should definitely talk to them. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about that Britney Spears wedding because we haven't gotten to it and I have, it's just some fun footage. So one of her first acts as a newly married woman is to get a restraining order against her ex husband, Jason Alexander. Not the Seinfeld, oh. Jason Alexander. Um, a judge granted... He crashed a party. Oh, well, he crashed this. the pre-party. Right. Uh, temporary restraining order against first husband, Jason, as well as hitting with a stalking charge. On Thursday before the wedding, he arrived uninvited at the estate. He streamed live, gave me like, what's up, everybody? Jason Alexander here, blah, 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 <laughs> on Instagram, armed with a knife. Um, so here's a clip, and this was long, and then it would like, because they're in Calabasas or something, the Wi-Fi kept going out, especially here's when the problem with the wedding and and this like the guy could you be 
Brittany. Okay. <laughs> and I'll be her husband to be whatever the his real name one. Is. Sam Ashgari. Sam Ashgari. Okay. And uh, we can find out that uh, your ex showed up with a, a knife and he was recording the whole thing and talking to the camera and putting it up on the internet and everything. And the problem is, is it starts off as this guy showed up, he had a knife, he was your ex. And, uh, and anyway, Brittany, we got security and we got him. Got him out of oh, there, so nothing's going to ruin this precious day. Oh, good, because I have like 14,000 bales of pink roses that I had flown in, and I really want this to be a perfect day because this is I my know, dream wedding. Madonna's going to be Madonna's here. Madonna's, Maria gonna, Menounos, everybody's going to be gonna here. You're going to reenact the whole kiss thing. That's and, right, we're yeah. going to dance, we're going to sing like a Thank virgin. God, we got this guy <laughs> off the property, he had a knife, he was oh, a maniac, and so, uh, glad he's so gone. we can move on, but... Uh, you thought it was a good idea to fuck this guy nine years ago? <laughs> Well, remember, we were only I mean, I understand this isn't a crazed homeless no, guy. I this understand. is a guy you blew. No, I did. I did. You understand? Blow him. Like, yeah, at some no, I did. point. We, we did. Hold on, the wedding planner. Yeah, give us 10 minutes. Yeah, we'll just, we need five. Are the guests are seated. They're uh, ready to go. Uh, mm-hmm. I, wanna, I just want to make a few. Yeah, honey, we should probably get going. I just want to alter my vows just a little bit here. Oh, okay, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you got, got a, a sharpie. Of the script. I just give us a minute here. You fuck this guy. You think that's a fucking I, know, I know. We were childhood friends. Do you think friends. he's here by coincidence or is he only here because you gave up the pussy so many years ago? It's probably because I gave up the pussy so many years <laughs> and ago. Now, we were... And by the way, how's your picker working? You know what I mean? I, I, I'd like to think it's fixed Out of now, all the Sam. guys. I mean, you're Britney fucking Spears. You yeah. know what I mean? You, you, you could have been with any count, any millionaire, yeah, any athlete. Want, <laughs> but he gave me his juice box when we were in third grade. I'll never forget it. Hi, it's me again. Um, the yeah. DJ is making an announcement, and uh, the guests can hear me. Yeah, Sam, let's go get they're, married. They're what do you say? They're just 12 feet away on the other side of this trellis. Hi, oh. guys. We love you, Brittany. Oh, love <laughs> you. You know she was fucking this guy. With oh, the, that okay, wasn't a homeless guy. Okay, um, okay Sam. He wasn't so a crazed <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> she used to blow that guy. This is how we joke. <laughs> no, it's not. It's me again. I'm fucking like, guy, she was like, married to him. This like, isn't some guy duty that just... to remind you, you're both wearing mic packs. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, listen. I'm I'm Come inviting on, baby, I'm you inviting say? your mom. No. Yes. Not Jamie. I or want her to know who one. you are. You're this oh. her first husband. No, they love the guy. He came over for oh, my they second love the grade knife birthday. Knife wielding guy oh. who's filming themselves wrestling with well, the security. Well, he didn't do it then. Come on. Where's Madonna? Oh no. She out there? Sam. Oh, Mr. Shikoni is seated in the fourth row. Okay. Are you guys going to have to do that fucking weird tongue kiss you did from MTV when I was nine? Yeah, otherwise nobody else will watch the video. Can you at least keep your pants on? Just please keep your pants on. I'll keep my blazer on. How about that? (laughs) Damn it. Let's go get married! Is there anyone else you blew who may show up with a hunting knife just so you can give me kind of a heads up before we go out there? That is literally that consists of the entire audience of this wedding. Mr. Timberlake is in row three. That's right. Oh, yuck. <laughs> and scene. Okay, so wow. let's, thank wow. you very much. Thank wow. you. We rehearsed that for days. That's wow. right. Uh, here's a clip of Jason Alexander live streaming when he crashes the pre-wedding, uh, setting up all the final shit, and right when he gets taken it's down. the time you want to crash. Yeah. I'm Jason Alexander, <laughs> first husband. Oh, I'm here to okay. crash the wedding, bro. <laughs> bro. Fuck that. They're not- so here's the inside scoop, guys, of the bullshit wedding. Jason Alexander, what's up? You love roses? You'll love this guy Who coming you? up, Michael. Michael, that's Michael, guys. It's Jason. First husband, here to crash it. Oh, my he doesn't God. Too shit. No, my name's Jason Alexander. Uh, Brittany invited me here. <laughs> Brittany Spears invited me here. She's my first wife, my only wife. I'm her first husband. I'm here to crash the wedding because nobody's and here but Sam. So where the fuck's the family and where's the security right there? Kate, yeah. Kate, come Kate. here, Kate. If he just played it a little cooler, he could have hung out for hours. Yeah. They tussle and then shit goes black. Yeah, he could have just 
said, Candy Graham. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go yeah. out himself an extra 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here to crash. Well, oh, you are, because we have security for people there. Here exactly. To, here to crash. So they got a restraining order. Um, but yeah, Maria Menunos, Kathy Hilton, Paris Hilton, Drew Barrymore, Madonna, Selena Gomez. But a smallish wedding. Definitely the family was not there. Yeah, they, they then Sam. Ashgari. Ashgari. Because I was watching TMC. Sure, we've heard. He showed up at like the, you know, Dunkin' Donuts in Calabasas or something the mm-hmm. next day, driving a white Rolls Royce with the flower bouquet in the back, and the just married still there. Oh, Playing it. He was miffed that the paparazzi oh, sure. were on to him. He was like, hey, man, can I have a little of my spa- <laughs> own space? Hey, guys, I'm trying to fly under the radar here, not drawing attention to myself. He's got a pearl white Rolls Royce with the just married shit, and the full the floral bouquet. arrangement is still on the trunk That's awesome. of the car. So at some point. Just leave him alone, guys. He didn't want to raise attention. That's he right. pulled it off. That's great. But he probably could have done that Without before the, he left the house. And maybe take a different car. That's right. Get like a Chrysler K car That's right. with a little Bondo yes. on the fender and slide right yes. under the radar. Yes. Um, but they do have a prenup. Um, even though she's not under conservatorship, somebody is handling her money, which is good because she, they did, they, apparently it's ironclad. If they get divorced, Sam doesn't get a dime. Do you think there's a thing like, you know how. When there's a sort of argument, especially with men and women, the guy will, or the woman will like come back with like nothing burgers a mm-hmm. lot. Mm-hmm. And like, like, do you think he did a thing where she's like, um, I, I, she had to say like, hey, look, I have a, a prenup. Mm-hmm. And then he had to like go, well, yeah, you know what? I got a prenup too. Mm. <laughs> so all those beanie babies, mm-hmm. those are going with me. Keep yeah. as yourself. And you be, I know you've been checking out the rims on that Jeep. Yeah. Guess what <laughs> rims are staying on the Jeep when I drive out of here? Not the rims. I'm not giving two of them to you. Oh. All right. And then I got <laughs> my cer- I got my uh, certificate from finishing a pig's trough at Farrell's. <laughs> Valley reference, keeping wow. that shit too. So whatever, and, I don't know what's on your shit. And this is I got fir- my own. This is firm. I got my own stuff. No wiggle room. I got a crescent wrench. Okay. I got a, I got a batting helmet. I got a helmet night at Dodger Stadium. <laughs> I got a windbreaker. I got a Santa Anita. It's all coming with me. <laughs> Hey, it's your wedding planner. I know this isn't my place. <laughs> Sorry, but, but the just... White Wolves Royce is ready to go with the flowers in the back and the just married. I know that was important to you. Yeah, I'm taking it down to five yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Do what you got to do. Wow. Yeah, this is well, this is the picture of it. But he drove. Huh. He, so it's so discreet. He, made, discreet. A, he made a Starbucks run the next morning. Wow. Low profile. To yeah. drive. And go get the Starbucks in the same vehicle. Yeah, he just wants to be left alone, guys. All right. Okay. I'm the same way with the guys who like leave Craig's on a Saturday night. Mm. It's like, oh, what's with the pop? <laughs> oh, no, no questions answered here. Like, don't go to fucking Craig's. Yeah. You should know by now. Yeah. Yeah. There's a Jerry's Deli every 15 feet. Go there. Yes. All okay. right. One more. All right. Well, um, Actually, Natanya, you might be interested in this, and there might be a role for you, and maybe me. Um, the script for the sequel to Joaquin Phoenix's Joker is complete. Oh, and did you that. hear, Brian? Yes, it I seems did. to be a musical. Wow. <laughs> Lady Gaga is in early talks to join the sequel, likely as Harley Quinn is the whisperings. Joaquin Phoenix read the script, not committed just yet to this musical. Um, it was revealed on social media that the title of the new project is Joker Fully Adieu, which apparently references a medical term for an identical or similar mental disorder that affects two or more individuals, uh, usually family members or someone in the family. He was Johnny Cash, right? He, he was. was. So he yeah. could do it. That's right. Uh, Todd Phillips will direct the film for Warner Brothers. He produced A Star is Born with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. Joker. The I musical. never saw the Joker because I felt like I was going to get depressed. It's very depressing. It's, heavy, I, heavy. it's not yeah. a fun it's, movie. Yeah, it's definitely. Heavy. It's not fun, but I got to say, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. I've probably seen it twenty times. It's you know, done maybe, really well. Maybe, maybe yeah. it's our version or this version or my son's sixteen. You know, his version of like Midnight Express. Everyone's like. Mm. Such a good movie, but good. never want to see it again. Uh, I, I, I just don't want to see it. Yeah, you know? like leaving Las Vegas. We can all agree it's a great movie. No. I don't want right. to see that shit again. Yeah, yeah. Right. one and done. 
Yeah, I have not seen It's very Shocker. good, but it's not fun. It's not but, fun you know, they've done the opposite um, because on Broadway there was Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, mm-hmm. and it was a fucking disaster. Yeah, they're having all those mishaps yeah. and injuries yeah. and, you know, what could go wrong. That's You're exactly putting cables right. on actors and slinging mm-hmm. them across the mm-hmm. stage and guys were crashing into shit. Exactly. And that was 20. A couple years ago. I thought 20? I wasn't two years ago, and now I have to... Now, well, you know your Broadway, Adam. Yeah, I just I'll say I remember it was, it was an older story. I'll say it was 15 ish years ago because the Spider Man movies kind of broke through in like 2000, 2001. Yeah, tw- 2010. Oh, oh, okay. Well, right in okay, the middle, good. but 12 years. No. Yeah. All right, let's bring it home. You Gina Grad. got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Happy well, masturbating. Yeah. Gina, Gina <laughs> Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. <laughs> Last but not least, there's Blinds Galore. They're having a massive 4th of July sale. It starts next week. You can celebrate with 50% off all custom blinds and shades. Get your free samples today. And uh, when you're ready, let's get started. It starts Wednesday, June 29th. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I have them actually at home. I have them in my office. I have my edit bays. It's blinds galore. Dr. Drew has them in his pool house, by the way, and his bedroom as well. I don't know if you uh, knew that, Paul Brian. You can save a ton. Right. Yeah, it's up in this master bedroom. Save a ton compared to a big box store designer look without the designer price tag. Family owned and run over 20 years. You can do it all from home. Take the measurements, customize it online, and uh, your blinds and shades will show up. And by the way, you can see exactly what it's going to look like online before you even squeeze the trigger. So get started with Blinds Galore. Am I right, Dawson? Order your free samples today so you'll be ready when Blinds Galore's 4th of July sale starts next week and everything will be up to 50% off. Visit BlindsGalore.com today and let them know that we sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com. All right, let me give a plug out one more time. Hopeofthevalley.org is where you can go to help these saints who are helping those who have trouble helping themselves. Uh, Natanya, thanks so much for uh, joining so us much. today, and Sean as well. And uh, come back and keep us updated, yeah. please. And congratulations on all the sobriety. You can go uh, you, to Thank adamcroll.com. So I'm going to be doing live shows coming up. Denver Comedy Works. We'll do some live pods there and some stand-up there. That'll be June 24th and 25th. Until next time, Adam Carolla for Sean Weiss, Natanya Ross, Gina Grad, and Bob Ryan. Say it. Mahalo. Versus, it is probably better to have stitches taken out of your ass because when they're taken out of your hand, you just turn your hand over and put it on the table, and then you just sit there and watch them do it, mm-hmm. and it looks like a mess. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's the ass, you can just bend over the table yeah. and read a magazine. Sure. Got some tweeting done under the boobs. Let me tell you, oh. I can't see shit.